there we go very good all right awesome all right so welcome everyone um good midday i guess not morning nor afternoon right on the middle um thank you very much for coming to this event um and thank you for the participants also the our um um our presenters um uh, dr thomas klein and architect tay carpenter thank you very much for coming um, I would like to introduce a little bit of the event itself um, and also uh, the, the series, a larger series, but then as well this specific event. Uh, so the foundation, foundation series is a series of events that I'm hosting within the umbrella of the 17th uh, Venice Architecture Biennale. It is included in the Space and Planetary Design Group that was uh, under the creative directorship of uh, Ed Keller. So thank you, Ed. And as well, um, this group is part of the Italian Virtual Pavilion, which were curated by Tom Novak and Alessandro Melis. Thank you as well for the invitation. And they were trying to um, respond with their curatorship to a big question of the, that was posed by the curator of the Biennale, which is how well we live together, which is the great theme of the exhibition. So we're very thankful for this uh, opportunity uh, to work within this theme of the Venice Biennale. Um, and the foundation series um, is basically asking a kind of very big questions. It's asking what will be the grounds that we will be walking on in the future? And what is our role in creating those grounds? We want to engage very key big questions about world making and inquire on the role of design thinking, making, shaping, and this kind of future of foundational systems that are going to um, be the way in which we may all live together by and with. And there are a series of uh, big themes within um, the foundations. And I'm going to show you just um, a, a presentation about those themes. Can you see the presentation well or the presenter notes? <laughs> I see the presentation. It looks, looks good. Looks good, great. All right, so the foundation series has these main themes. Each session deals with an important aspect of those key questions, the crust today, token, uh, uh, currency and coins, weather, habitat, and then peace. And so in the foundation's crust, which is the event today, we will be asking questions literally about that concept of the new geological crust that supposedly we are creating as human beings in this new Anthropocene area. So in 2012, these plans for the Yucca Mountain, which was a volcanic tough geological formation in Tonopah, Nevada, to become a nuclear waste repository were paused, if not laid to rest, after this long process that tried to wrangle toxicity, science, nature, public health, territory, and management. Um, and after this long process that tried to wrangle this, we, we understood a series of metrics. There are 70,000 metric tons of nuclear waste that are currently stored in a, around 121 sites around the USA. And the nuclear waste repositories are designed to host these different levels of hazardous spent nuclear fuel and other high to low level radioactive waste. The radioactive waste is then produced by activities such as this nuclear energy production, uh, and there are currently 104 nuclear reactors in the US, but the US is also still cleaning up its nuclear test sites, producing various level of medium level hazardous waste that need to sit undisturbed for a long radioactive decay. At this time, some of these nuclear waste materials are brought to the waste isolation pilot plant, the WIP, in Carlsbad, New Mexico. This was a facility commissioned to host medium level transuranic radioactive waste from nuclear waste, nuclear weapons only. This facility sits on a very different geological ground than the Yucca Mountain. The WIP is over salt beds, which are behaving a bit more like mud and therefore are considered to be self-healing under stress. And some of these materials have to sit and wait for a really long time, thousands, tens of thousands, and even perhaps one million years, 
in the words of Dr. Abraham Van Lewick, far after anyone that you ever cared about has died. And when this site then closes in 2050 and sits waiting for the decade to happen, this another project starts, which is the project of communicating into the future, a far off unknown future with a distant unpredictable culture that something lays underneath. This is the project of the memory markers, monuments that need to maintain the accuracy of a message for a very long, akin to geological time. <clears throat> this is a profound exercise in ethics and calls for very radical design attitudes that can integrate diverse science fields, linguistics, semiotics, and engages different domains of policy. Designing for this problem is nothing short of reinventing a new crust of the earth for all, us all to walk on. So today we have our guest speakers are uh, Dr. Thomas Klein. He has practiced in the field of environmental stewardship, cleanup, review, and design for the past 40 plus years. And Mr. Klein received his bachelor's degree in biology from Emporia State University in 1980 and the master's degree in environmental biology in 1984. And um, Thomas Klein has also been involved with the regulatory compliance aspects of the waste isolation pilot plan for the last 20 years. And Tay Carpenter is an architectural designer, educator, and founder of Agency, Agency an award-winning New York City-based architecture and design firm. And her design and research work has been supported by a number of organizations. I'm, I'm not going to mention all the bio because it, it is um, present in the event bright and all the descriptions, but Tay basically has um, work on this amazing project for a memory marker for the WIP, um, uh, so the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, and it has been an awarded um, project, and it's a very, very radical, very intriguing uh, project uh, that we'll be discussing today. And so with that, I'll stop sharing. Um, and maybe we will, uh, I, so I want to thank again, um, Thomas Klein for coming and Tay Carpenter, thank you so much for coming today. Um, I hope that was not too long of an introduction. I wanna mainly hear from you. And um, maybe we'll start then with uh, Thomas. Do you want to um, share your presentation? Sure. First off, good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you are surviving the pandemic on a high note. Um, definitely gives everybody a lot of time to be able to uh, contemplate some of the ideas that uh, we'll be talking about today. Um, basically, what I looked at, I, I started involvement with the Passive Institutional Control Program at the waste isolation pilot plant um, around 2009. Um, originally, uh, that plan or that uh, program had uh, been developed in the 1990s. And uh, what we found out was there, we had some questions that we couldn't get answered. Um, to understand what's going on with the uh, deep geologic repositories. Uh, I know it's boring topic, but uh, it is our starting point. And that is to look at regulations, both in the United States and internationally. So we'll take a look at those first, then we'll look at the proposed design for the waste isolation pilot plant, and then just uh, look into some of the problems that that design has uh, shown. Uh, regulatory wise, uh, internationally, uh, the Europe European Union uh, with council directive in 2011 established a framework that uh, for especially for nuclear waste disposal uh, is the ethical requirement that uh, each member state of the European Union uh, is expected to be able to take steps to ensure that the objective of informing 
future generations um, of the location and of the hazard. And that's pretty interesting if we look at that it's, it's an ethical decision that the politicians um, and the, the uh, presidents and the various countries have taken upon themselves to be able to put an ethical human requirement for future generations. Now in the United States, uh, they have two regulations, 40 CFR 191, which basically establishes the waste isolation pilot plant and the assurance requirements for that to assure that there won't be any effect on uh, humans or the environment in the future. The specific guidelines on doing that is under 40 CFR 194.43 for the Passive Institutional Control Program. And it, it also goes into uh, detail as to what needs to be looked at. And those are the two basic ones. Following 191 and 194, the uh, Department of Energy then submitted a compliant, or it's compliance certification application, the CCA. And then from that, after about uh, a few years of discussions with the regulatory agency, which was the, there is the Environmental Protection Agency, then uh, the agency issued a rulemaking establishing that uh, what the DOE had proposed met the requirements and they could go ahead and start accepting the waste. From the European Union requirements, uh, the NEA uh, out of Paris established the Preservation of Records, Knowledge and Memory or RKM group. Uh, this is, uh, was originally led by Dr. Claudio Pescator, um, and that group, uh, I was lucky enough to be a part of that with a colleague of mine. Uh, we were able to put together one small part of the requirements, and that small part is how and what kind of records need to be passed on to future generations. What information are we going to give the future? Um, in doing that and putting that together, uh, it was obvious very quickly that uh, this is not just a one scientific discipline approach, but that it's going to take numerous disciplines involvement to be able to come to something that could actually work and be able to one way communicate to uh, people in the future, to future generations. The first part that they came up with is every member state would come up with a key information file. And this was expected to be 20 pages or less, something that would be a little bit more palatable to the masses to be able to inform them of the location of the repository and its contents. Initially, they were looking at uh, putting in the requirement that this would not be a place of honor. This is uh, a dangerous place, uh, stay away. But uh, quickly on, especially with Dr. Van Loop, uh, we decided that you really could not put um, a, re a requirement or a label on this uh, for future generations, that they should decide that uh, amongst themselves. The second set of records <clears throat> is a set of essential records. Uh, this is estimated to be about a 2000 page document that will have the basic information that could be passed on, say to future scientists as to the contents and uh, the development or design of the repository. 
And then finally, there would be, especially in the United States, a complete set of records, uh, which is a requirement of the DOE for the waste isolation pilot plant. Um, I, I couldn't even begin to estimate right now what that uh, size of that complete set of records is, but uh, I, I can tell you it is increasing on a daily basis. And this is the design that was submitted for the uh, waste isolation pilot plant. Uh, as you can see, it is uh, a center information center uh, which would basically be a room uh, with different panels in it that uh, would have the information etched into and uh, be able to provide basically uh, very similar information to the key information file and some of the additional uh, set of essential records. It is surrounded uh, by monoliths and this area is directly over the emplacement part of the repository. Uh, those monuments are granite and are will be engraved uh, with different messages. I believe they uh, chose seven different languages to uh, put the information on, and that would be etched into the mo into the monoliths also. And then that is surrounded by a berm. And this berm is 90 feet wide, 30 feet high, and was originally designed to have a salt core, which is the salt that was dug up from the repository um, to utilize what they had already. Uh, they also would have two buried and sealed information rooms, one of them uh, also being a, the hot cell, which is the remote handled waste cell uh, at WIP for handling the uh, higher wattage or uh, hotter waste. And so this is kind of it in a nuts, nutshell. Uh, the Yucca Mountain Project also took this basic setup. Uh, they adapted it to a mountainous terrain. Um, so it's whatever the design ends up being, it needs to be something that can be adapted as far as the basics to each and every uh, location across the globe. Uh, my vision for this is that whatever the design is, if uh, you see it when you are uh, at the waste isolation pilot plant in the United States, you will see something similar uh, in Sweden or France or Germany. Um, Excuse me. We'll ignore that for right now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so uh, it's something that that as we look at in the future, we we will be a global civilization, each with its own unique uh, attributes. But it needs to definitely. Uh, be something that if you recognize uh, the repository parts in one country and see it in another, you'll automatically know there is a repository at that location. <clears throat> now, some of the problems with the original design for WIP, the 30-foot the berm surrounding the site, um, even though we are in a high desert, uh, Chihuahuan desert area, uh, we do get rainstorms that uh, can drop uh, anywhere from one to four inches of rain periodically in one location over an extremely short period of time. And by having that berm around the site, the site would essentially become a pond for uh, a short period of time. That would affect the uh, information room at the center of the site. Um, and uh, any drainage that would be put in may affect some of the other mo uh, monuments there. So that needs to be relooked at. Uh, also in my research, there is no granite quarry that has been identified that can produce granite monuments 
at the scale that they have in the design. And even if they did, we have no way of transporting that size of granite monument to the whip site. So a definite uh, high cost would have to be put into place to uh, basically produce the equipment who can uh, uh, cut out the granite monuments and then transport them to the whip site. In addition, uh, for the whip site, one of the items that uh, they looked at burying scattered throughout the site are one, radar reflectors, and the second one would be uh, discs that would be placed in the underground uh, so that if someone did try to start to excavate at that location, they would come across those discs, which would uh, basically make everything stop and say, wait a minute, what is this, et cetera. Um, and for all of us who have been through college, how many stop signs did you find in dorm rooms uh, my feeling is these small awareness triggers will end up being um, taken from the site so if they cannot remain at the site uh, then definitely their awareness capabilities would be useless in addition uh, initially the department of energy uh, sent out notices to all the various libraries, uh, the library of uh, the Smithsonian and a few other locations in the United States, uh, colleges and universities, that uh, they would be locations for storage of the uh, data about the design and contents of the site. Uh, unfortunately, the majority of those institutions never responded and did not say that they would agree to do that because there would be a cost involved. Because of that and because of the unknown, there's no funding source that's been identified to continue to monitor the WIP site after closure. Uh, it's a hope and a prayer that each generation will decide to continue to do that. So it's something that uh, politically Funding just isn't there. An additional uh, question came up that the durability of the granite monoliths was uh, questionable over the 10,000 year requirement time frame for the waste isolation pilot plant. This is mainly due to weathering, scaling, things like that, that would affect the granite. Um, at that point in time, I actually recommended uses, using panels of depleted uranium as the mon monuments, uh, but it was immediately shut down. But I think that's still an option. We need to look at something that is definitely extremely durable. Now, under the EPA regulations for the waste isolation pilot plant, one word comes up on PICS. Uh, at the very beginning from the Environmental Protection Agency, and that is that these monuments should be as permanent as practicable. Uh, the definition of that is, is unknown, uh, but if we are looking and the compliance certification application said that this would be a, a 10,000 year time frame, then that is what um, the monument should be designed toward. If a design cannot be made that can last that long under all the different changes that are going to be coming across over the next 10,000 years, uh, then it also needs to be built in that it would have a uh, way of renewing the monuments periodically. And in addition to all this, right now there's no way to protect the location from future generations. Um, and, and I've got some examples of that. Uh, initially, we did, uh, we buried the very first uh, nuclear reactor in the Chicago area. And this was the monument that was placed 
at one of the locations. And if you'll notice, it's been vandalized. The wording literally has been changed and there's bits and pieces that have been chiseled off. So without any way of protecting this, its message is going to fail and has already failed in one generation. Uh, we've got the tsunami stones. Um, Dr. Van Luke was uh, really interested in this. Uh, and what we found out was because language changes dramatically every 500 to 700 years, that a lot of the residents in the area could not even read what was on the stones. Uh, a new stone has been in place in, in a few areas, but if it wasn't for the elderly members of the community, the information that that stone was passing on would have been lost. And for the, uh, the whip area itself, uh, back in the plowshare area of uh, the 70s, 60s and 70s, where they were looking for um, a way to use nuclear power uh, for humans than uh, against humans, they tested uh, an underground explosion <clears throat> called uh, Project Gnome. This is the marker at the Gnome site. Uh, it's, as you can see, it has bullet holes in it. There's a uh, plaque on the very top that was removed. Uh, in addition, this is, was not found at the location it was originally placed because cattle was use, were using it as a rubbing stone to scratch their backs and it literally got moved. So without some way of protecting, we've got to have a system uh, that if we aren't going to protect it, we will at least be able to uh, stop this type of activity as best as we can. Uh, let's see, so it, it, my view is that what needs to be done is the entire WHIP passive institutional program needs to be revisited. And it needs to be revisited by all disciplines, sociology, psychology, archaeology, uh, architecture, uh, the sciences of physics and materials, um, geology, geography, it all needs to be involved in this, not just a few. Uh, in addition, we've got the political thumbs up with the regulations from the European Union and the United States. Um, and at that point in time, they need now, they've done their job, they need to get out of the way and let the researchers from each of the disciplines step in and start putting the program together. One thing, uh, since we are looking at every 500 to 700 years, that language would change dramatically. We need to look, is there a way of adapting the message to future language changes? Um, I was actually, and still am, looking in uh, to possibly using artificial intelligence for this. Uh, but I definitely am no expert in that field, and uh, I would leave that to them to see if it's actually feasible and how it would need to be done. As you can see also, we need to figure out a way of funding future maintenance of the location and protection of the location. That has not been developed yet. Um, because of the political upheaval across the world, uh, we need to make sure that that funding source is secure if it's not coming from actual governments. And then, of course, uh, my original concept of the basics design should be acceptable globally with a common message so that if you come across it in one country, uh, you'll automatically know that it was some it was a nuclear waste repository in another country. 
And I believe that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you. That was awesome. I, I just wanted to clarify to everyone that um, there is a YouTube uh, that is being recorded privately with the entire thing, and it will be posted um, at a later time. Okay. Um, Tay, do you want to start? Great. Um, let me just share my screen. One second. Okay. How's that? Okay. Okay. Good. Well, um, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining, Carla. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and Tom, really great to see the presentation. I hadn't seen that material that you just presented. Tom and I met um, like four years ago at the um, four years ago, I think, at the Radioactive Waste Management Symposium in Phoenix. Yes. Um, and it was really a, a fascinating panel that we had, because actually, just as you're saying, Tom, we had uh, on the panel was were scientists, engineers, artists. Um, there was a French semiotician who was there. Um, and so it was a really fantastic discussion. So it's really um, wonderful to see you again <laughs> um, for all this. So. Um, uh, let's see, so I, I just put some slides together to kind of talk through a little bit of some of my own interests in, um, I guess, architecturally um, around this topic that Carla presented about foundations and, and grounds. Um, and then I, I, I'm going to present um, three projects, um, including the test bed project. Um, and so um, recently in my work, and I think over the past several years, I've been um, interesting in this idea from um, Jane Bennett, who has a book called Vibrant Matter on the Political Ecology of Things. Um, and we've been thinking in the practice, we've been thinking more and more about an idea of lively things. So an approach that's kind of a way of seeing the liveliness in inanimate things. Um, I think in particular for this talk, I think the idea of um, materials, material life, material lifespans, um, duration, animals, plants, a kind of non-human way of thinking about the actors that we engage with as architects. Um, and, and Jane Bennett talks about how inanimate things have this ability to both act and also produce effects that are both dramatic and subtle. Um, and she argues that it's our ethical task at hand to cultivate this ability to discern, to discern non-human vitality and to become perceptually open to it. Um, as, a, as an approach to uh, treating non-humans more carefully or strategically or, or more ecologically. Um, and so just sort of thinking out how to decenter the human as a subject, um, but also thinking about how to decenter the kind of notions of temporality and time that perhaps come with us, um, come with humans as, as, as subjects. Um, and so I guess through that lens, I want to share three projects with you, um, including the WIP site project, um, and try at the very end to bring it back to the building scale, just to sort of think about how these begin to link up in my work. Um, and so I think just to try to set up two frameworks um, around this concept of um, entanglements, I wanna talk about coexistence and material life um, and how I think about the work. And so I like starting with this image of this crab in a bottle cap, um, which is a photograph by um, Man Manabu Miyazaki. Um, and I think that for me, it really kind of talks about this tension between society and nature. Um, you know, perhaps that this, this is not a binary, but in fact, um, they're increasingly intertwined, they're inter uh, codependent, interdependent, and perhaps even rely on one another. Um, and I think that that also suggests a kind of approach to sustainability that perhaps mitigates human impact while also admitting to it um, through new modes of material reuse and also a kind of co-production with nature. And so for me, I think thinking about how the environment, how nature can actually be an agent in processes is something that I've um, personally been really interested in thinking about in my work. Um, and so this might be maybe perhaps counter to let's say 1970s architectural responses um, to environmental crises like um, Fuller and Sadao's Dome Over Manhattan, which um, demanded this kind of binary between um, outside and inside um, society and nature. Um, and instead, I think this idea of coexistence, right? Like how can we uh, co-production? So modes of collaboration, maybe working with nature, not against it. Um, and I think designing for 
and with multiple species um, and environments. And I think um, the idea of a material life th that I think about is um, perhaps tied to this diagram of the Kallenborg Industrial Eco Park in Denmark, um, which describes an industrial ecology. So essentially one in which the inputs and the outputs of the system are circular and exchanges of materials, energies, water produce um, really productive overlaps um, that suggest perhaps a metabolic process or also suggests a kind of um, way in which we might begin to kind of um, suggest material reliances, codependences, um, and kind of deep engagement with material life cycles, um, waste and reuse that um, suggest something that's maybe not a kind of one-off, but that materials have lives um, beyond their what they're primarily intended for. And like, how can we begin to kind of mine that in different ways? Um, I'm also interested in the ways, kind of strange and accidental ways, that these natural processes have been hybridized, um, interrupted, accelerated by human impact. Um, this is a, a photograph of plastic glomerate, which is a new rock that was not so long ago added to the US Geological Survey, um, which is made primarily out of plastic, um, which I think solidifies this notion of um, deep time, let's say, into something that's very tangible, that you can actually start to see these layers and stratas um, building up into one another and that the idea of that plastic is now officially a rock, um, something I think really fascinating. And this is an image of a bullock's oriole nest from the Corn Cornell Museum of Vertebrates. Um, so bird's nest, that, uh, it's actually made by a species of oriole here that um, builds its nest almost exclusively out of human waste. So particularly construction netting. And so just the idea that human waste you know, has this one kind of output, but then it gets folded into and tangled into other kind of lifespans and um, environments and ecologies um, after afterwards. And so just again, kind of trying to reinforce that idea of this long time span. So, you know, how could we um, move beyond prevailing sustainability discourse um, that things like lead checklists tend to tend towards, let's say objective metrics, um, assumptions about controlling a stable version of nature or a pristine version of nature. Um, and instead, could we begin to focus um, on developing a kind of architectural language around um, ideas of hybridization, entanglement between humans and nature? And so I think that um, this idea really tries to admit to uh, human impact um, through, through material reuse and also this kind of notions of co-production. And so um, I'll start with the testbed project. Um, which was, this is the uh, 2017, I think, or 2018, maybe? I think 2017. Um, this is the project for the winning design for a marker system for the WIP site that Tom was just talking about in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Um, it was part of a um, competition, it was a winning design for a competition held by Arch Out Loud. Um, and uh, I first came across this history of the site. I had actually been really fascinated by it before. And, if some of you don't know about um, this movie, it's a film by Peter Gallison and Rob Moss called Containment. Um, and this is when I had first heard about the story about the website. So I highly recommend this, uh, this film, but the briefs of the competition asked for a system that could communicate the dangers of nuclear waste buried below the surface um, and to also deter human entry there for up to 10,000 years. Um, and so Peter Gallison has talked about this as a task that is both impossible and necessary, um, you know, simultaneously. So he talks about, Gallison talks about the importance of bringing the invisible into visibility um, because unseeable abstractions uh, like nuclear waste, which has, um, I believe it has a half-life of 24,000 years, um, vanish from national awareness once um, they're externalized outside of perceptual range. Um, and so the site itself, just to give you a little context, um, it's about 16 square miles in the middle of the desert in New Mexico. It's managed by the Department of Energy um, to maintain both active and then also passive controls for the life of the site. Um, and Tom, you should jump in if I'm if if there's any kind of corrections here. Um, but it will be closing down as an active control relatively soon, from what I understand. Um, and so this is a, an image um, from the US Department of Energy uh, inside of a waste isolation pilot plant, um, similar to others around the world, um, where nuclear waste is disposed of by burying it in this repository that Carla was describing, um, about 2000 feet below the surface. 
and it relies on the self-sealing geological storage of the nuclear waste within the salt formations that creep due to pressure. Um, and so they eventually collapse and encapsulate the nuclear waste within the Earth's crust. And so it becomes part of the geology, essentially. Actually, Tay, I think that actually is uh, one of the repositories in either Germany or France. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. So this is the image of the WIP facility in, it's a self, it's a, but it's a salt formation. It's in yeah. the salt formations. Yeah. Concept is, is the same. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and to put the time scale of the 10,000 years, I think in perspective, let's say the caves of Lascaux are about 25,000 years old, um, and then Stonehenge dates back to roughly, let's say 6,000 years ago. And so effectively, uh, the task of this project is to uh, make a marker system that has to be both durable and then also communicate its function to future, future generations um, to deter both entry and also drilling. Um, until uh, 12,000 AD. And so in, in a sense, like what Tom was saying is the marker has to be transliteral. Like it has to be able to speak uh, multiple languages, but then also perhaps communicate to a future generation that um, perhaps has a different form of communication um, for up to 10,000 years. And so it also would need to communicate with other species. Um, and so when uh, these were some of the earlier proposals um, for the WIP site in 1993 from the Sandia Laboratory proposals. I'd included this just for some context um, for some people who haven't seen this before. Um, and I think that this competition uh, included participation by engineers, geologists, futurists, and artists. Um, and so I think that top grid is um, spikes bursting through grid, um, which is essentially this kind of overlaid Cartesian grid punctured by these massive granite spikes across the site. And then the bottom one is, it's called Black Hole, uh, proposed pouring this black dead concrete across the 16 square miles so that it would become very, very hot from the sun. So essentially it would become kind of uninhabitable. Um, and so I think as a starting point, um, we were thinking about some of the work of Anna Singh at the Mushroom of the End of the World. And she describes this approach that accepts the environment this kind of compromised condition um, and emits coexistence and contamination. Um, and I think here this piece by Julian Sherrier perhaps helps illustrate it, it certainly has some, um, some affinities with the plastic lama sample. Here he presents this future fossil that's comprised of artificial lava and molten computer waste. So bringing into view the byproducts of human extraction that are being folded into these larger scales of geologic time. Um, I think in the work, we were also looking at some of the land art and earthworks of the 1960s. So thinking about um, these much larger projects that weren't necessarily producing objects or monuments, but rather producing these large scale environmental um, processes that were dealing with time and entropy um, as kind of primary agents to form the site itself. Um, and so, you know, with the, at least with the 1993 proposals, um, many of the solutions try to use fear as um, modes of deterring entry. And uh, what we wanted to do instead is to propose something a little bit different is I think a kind of critical commentary as much as anything. Um, instead it proposed a gridded field of carbon dioxide capturing strategies that essentially produce this active marker system that stores one form of energetic byproduct, which would be the carbon dioxide um, in the surface above another, which would be the nuclear waste um, below it. Um, and so I think Part of the project is also a kind of representational interest in how to begin to draw and understand and make visible some of these questions. And so this was a core sample of the project that, you know, indicates the geological strata um, and, and tries to kind of signal that longevity as it relates to the layers of the earth. So trying to um, collapse both the past and the future in, into a single drawing and trying to communicate that language. Um, and so these were diagrams of the of the WIP site on the very top, that it was an array of carbon dioxide capturing technologies um, in the row above, and that they essentially kind of mitigate the effects of global warming through decarbonization um, that included things like direct air capture, which were are essentially building scale artificial trees, um, as well as um, in situ and also ex situ um, geologic and mineral sequestration. Um, and we had been sort of working um, just in conversation with some, some scientists about some of this technology. Um, and so I think that this is the kind of final perspective of the project, but 
The idea is that it's really designed as a kind of entropic process um, that can transform over this very deep time with a combination of these um, formations that are both natural and then also artificial. And that through its continued growth and its transformation over, the, over time, these new geologies actually mark the site as something that's kind of deeply strange and unfamiliar and perhaps both deter human and non-human entry and communicating otherness by intervening in these fundamental processes. Um, and so I think Carla, I, I can end here so that there's enough time for questions or I can also present a couple other projects. Um, it's, it's up to you if you want to also, if you know, if you want to present a bit more, maybe that's, that's fine. Okay. They were uh, part of I the present presentation. Yeah, yeah, why don't I present one more just I think to, um, I'll, I'll present this one. So this is um, another project. And I think, uh, just to say that I think Tom and I had some really interesting conversations when we when we met, just around sort of the role of storytelling and narrative. And anyway, we can get into that in the Q&A. But um, just to maybe expand upon some of the ideas I just mentioned with, with Testbed, um, this is a project called Placapa, which was a, a kind of uh, winning competition for this new floating island in the North Pacific subtropical gyre. And so in a sense, I think it, it, it works with the WIP project as a kind of cautionary tale um, in the spirit of Italo Calvino's um, story of Leonia from the Book of Invisible Cities. Um, in, in that story, Calvino describes a city that essentially values newness and cleanliness to such an extent that it refashions itself um, every day, expelling its old used goods in favor of the new. And so as the story goes, out of sight of the city's inhabitants, mountains of rubbish surround the city becoming more indestructible as time passes, this kind of reflection on consumption and discard. Um, and so I think that the, the project is cited, the island is cited in the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, which is also known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, um, which is a swirling mass of this essentially invisible detritus that's located in the Pacific Ocean, not so far away from Hawaii. Um, and it's where the highest density of marine debris and microplastics collect through the natural wind um, and also current conditions to form this gyre that's the size of a small continent. And so many people think it looks like um, the image on the bottom, but in fact, it really looks more like the image on the top because um, it's made up of um, invisible microplastics um, at subsurface depths. Um, so the gyre is one of only five in the world. And so I think like, like Leonia and Calvino's uh, story, it's an externality that exists in the world, but we're not confronted with its effects um, because it's so distant. But I think increasingly the consequences of this overconsumption and discard are creeping into reality. And so this is um, a photograph of Camillo Beach in Hawaii. And Camillo Beach in Hawaii is actually the site of where the plastic lomerit that I showed you at the very beginning was first found. Um, and so the design of the main island and its archipelago is produced over time between nature's ocean currents and also human-made waste. So not adding any material, but rather um, over time and with increasing temperatures of the earth, using the stuff of the gyre to become the materiality and then also the design palette of the island. And so this is a this is what's called a false color density representation. So kind of borrowing from scientific color rendering to visualize the non-visible parts of a photograph. And so to make visible the density and the accumulation of plastic waste in the ocean that would otherwise be invisible to the eye. Um, and so the island that's, this is a geological plan or a geological section is essentially a kind of index of disposability and consumption. So coded in color by types of detritus and plastic that most commonly is found by scientists um, exploring the gyre, um, like polyethylene, which is shown in pink, plastic bags, foam containers, or nylon, which is green, fishing nets and ropes. And so essentially it's kind of a diagram. Um, and the design uses the ocean currents, the winds, the, the density of waste to speculate on uh, formation over time. So similar to test bed, um, the formation of these hard plastic escarpments, these sea stacks of natural and organic materials. Um, and I think representationally we're using uh, geological mapping techniques um, like those in the Julius Caesar quadrangle of the moon uh, shown here, which can visualize these slow environmental transformations to the ground that occur within these immense scales of space and time. Um, and so the conventions of this drawings, like many, not all, but some terrestrial geological maps. They use color to record the relative age of, of moon rocks um, with surrounding craters and, and floors. And so effectively like trying to register what's unseen and links time to material. Uh, so the island is really imagined as producing its own extreme ecosystem within the waste with this new vitality that's based on marine food chain adaptation and metal metabolizing critters 
like plastic eating bacteria, which would at once metabolize the island while, while binding enzymes help produce the island's ground, uh, along with the heat effects of, of coagulating plastic. And so it's an island that, that grows taller as humans expel more goods while simultaneously becoming more buoyant uh, due to the properties of plastic, eventually replacing icebergs as inverted artificial likenesses um, and continually drifting through the ocean as physical indicators of consumption. Um, so I think maybe I'll leave it there. Actually, I think that that's a good place to, to maybe end. And I think these are just wanted to share a couple sort of um, thoughts and just put th some things on the table for, for discussion at the end. So thank you. Thank you, that's fantastic. I didn't know this project, wonderful. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for both your presentations. Um, I confess I had thought of, you know, segueing into one of my questions, but given the scale, you know, of the, of the conversation group we have here, I, I'm just going to um, let people unmute and ask questions so we can take really good care of this half hour and I can bring my own questions if that makes sense at some point. Does that, does that make sense? Yes? All right. Um, so let me just, um, sorry. So if the if the attendees, if anyone wants to ask a question, if you can just unmute yourself, or if you want to write it in the chat, I can also um, read it that way. I, I do want to add that uh, for Ty's submittal to the Arts Out Loud competition, uh, I got to be one of the judges. And uh, <laughs> The, the reason that her design was selected was uh, because it solves some of the problems that I had mentioned on being able to maintain the location into the future. If you have a, another active scientific or industrial site at the same location, uh, it kind of helps to maintain that uh, level of maintenance and security. Uh, while at the same time, keeping the memory of what's buried beneath it going. Yes. That, that was my, my reason for choosing Ty's uh, proposal. <laughs> yes, and, and actually, you know, one of my, um, my follow-up questions or comments, perhaps, maybe I can uh, bring it up, is the fact that we've been having, um, I, I mean, I can also show, you know, like the example of the Ray Cats, uh, in contrast with the Aneoshi village uh, stone markers, um, there seems to exist, of course, um, a series of discourses around impermanence and the need for adaptive adaptive systems to, you know, engage the the flow, literally the change, the dynamics of of sites that we build for these days, um, or maybe always. But when we look at very deep timelines the same problem applies for the problem of permanence that to for a message to continue to be consistent it has to actually modify itself that's a really interesting also like conceptual dilemma for the theory of message and communication right so this idea that you have to run to stay put <laughs> to a degree that that would happen as well to the problem of message and, and permanence in these markers um, and you know, I, I'm I'm curious whether you know, there's, there's a the salt beds, but also the test beds are literally talking about that problem, and that we have to follow to follow a dynamic of systems, and um, also in the waste management facility that I went to at, in 2019, uh, Tom, the there was this talk of adaptability. <laughs> Our systems now had to be adaptable and redundant. That actually now the new term was redundancy. Um, and that was really interesting. And, you know, there's, there's this, this shift of like the monolith is almost like reinterpreted into what really makes it, what makes something resilient through time or permanent through time is actually that kind of capacity to even, to a degree, change part of its message while continuing another. And I wonder actually if this is happening in all the fields or if it's more in the moments where... Um, design thinking is trying to bridge across too many skills, either of space or time. I wonder if this is, um, you know, so this is a bit more of a comment or a question. Like, I imagine in your fields, you have particular insights into this. Um, and I, you know, I wonder if it's just something that is happening all over or has always been there 
and we just haven't, now we talk about dynamic systems that way. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, definitely, uh, yeah, you're spot on. Uh, recently, there was a, uh, a test that they did because some of the original designs were like the skull and crossbones, which is supposed to uh, present an ominous and dangerous uh, sign for an area. And uh, they, they interviewed a bunch of school children and showed them the skull and crossbones, asked them what that meant. And uh, a lot of them came back and said, oh, that's the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movie. <laughs> they did not relate that at all. They related the skull and co crossbones to pirates. Um, so it's something that uh, the interpretation, uh, how it's viewed down the road, definitely has to be changed or be adaptable. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe maybe I'll uh, open it up to um, to some of the audience for some questions. You can unmute yourselves or write in the uh, chat. I see, yes, Fred, um, I think you can, um, yes, you can unmute, yes. Hi, Hi. yeah, thanks for, thanks for um, putting this on, you all. It's, it's really neat to see like the three different sort of moments in the, in the history of the project, like the 1993 work has become such a kind of cultural touchstone. It, it like has its own independent life in the cultural imagination in North America, I think, and uh, have it put into context with the current state of, of WIP is really fascinating. And then, to, and then to see your critique of it, Thomas, is like takes it to another level. And then I see like Tay is taking things into the speculative domain in a, in a different way. And I, I wanted to ask about that, Tay and Thomas, like the kind of the question of feasibility and, um, and plausibility even, like how does that enter into the way in which like the intentions of the work act like almost at any time I think anybody's going to encounter something like this in the future they'll be like oh that's just like the WIPP uh you know warning proposals it, it it has such an independent life as a thing that like it almost exists more as science fiction than science fact and so it has these different resonances and like I I just this is a really unformed question but like Tay and your work like like, would you start working on this if somebody gave you the budget? Like, would this, and do you approach it as like, okay, I'm going to act primarily in the cultural imagination, or do you approach it as like, I'm going to act primarily in the realm of plausibility and, you know, anticipate like objections or people poking holes in the, in the scenario or what? Like, like, where do you target that? It's a really good question. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. I'm, I think what was really fascinating when we were at this conference together was um, that I think that we had really targeted, like I was really ta targeting more of like the cultural imagination, the kind of speculation on what this place could be, what it could look like, um, that would maybe counter these fear tactics and would sort of counter uh, the big, the big object, the big, you know, that, that, that this is about fear and instead trying to sort of think about it differently as a site that can sort of do double duty. It could do more than that. It could perform. It could also, you know, actually um, be visited and be an active place. And so that through that activity and through 